All right, well, welcome you guys to the Connected 2019 uh, Bible study today. We're going to be um, talking about the readings that we did this past week in our one year Bible. And um, I do want to remind you guys that if for whatever reason life happens and you don't get a chance to read whatever that week's reading was, it's okay to still come. Please still come. Don't feel like you can't come because a lot of our discussion is going to be based on what I teach in here. And so even if you didn't read it all, it's no big deal. Okay, I want you to come. If you can't see me right here, you're welcome to kind of turn your chair around and rearrange yourself so that you can see. Uh, because I'm going to be speaking for about 30, 30 minutes. Now, do you know how tough it was for me to figure out what to teach on? I mean, we have covered a lot of ground. We have talked about um, Abraham. We've talked about creation. He had one baby with Hagar and then another baby with his wife, Sarah. All right, we've been through the flood. We have, um, Jesus has been born. He's been baptized. He has been healing people, casting out demons. He calmed the storm this morning. Wasn't that a great passage to read? Jesus calming our storms. I mean, there's so much to speak from. It became a difficulty for me to figure out, man, I've got like 10 talks I could do with all this. You know, which one, you know, is perfect for us? And I don't know, but I want you to know I prayed about it. And I was like, Lord, you know the women in this room and what they may need the most. And so, Father, would you just help me settle on one of these many topics that I could speak on? And yesterday morning, as I was beginning to prepare for our time today, God reminded me of four little words. Out of everything that we've read in Genesis, Psalms, Proverbs, and Matthew, there were four tiny words that came to my mind, and those are the ones we're going to double-click on today. What are those words? Well, you're going to have to hang in there with me. i got to <laughs> set the stage, and we'll get there, okay? <laughs> So what I want you to do is go ahead and open your Bible, if you brought your one-year Bible or a regular Bible, um, find um, Genesis chapter 6 and 7, because those four little words are actually found in the account of Noah and the ark and the flood, okay? But when I was doing my research, I stumbled upon a funny little list, and it's called, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned from Noah's Ark, okay? <laughs> So all you need to know from life, this guy said, I learned from Noah's Ark. One of them is, you got to plan ahead. It wasn't raining when the ark was built. <laughs> plan ahead. Number two, stay fit. Because when you're really old, Noah was 500, someone might ask you to do something really big. So it's a good thing we're in here at the YMCA. Got to stay fit. Uh, number three, speed isn't always an advantage. The cheetahs were on board the ark, but so were the snails. Remember, the ark was built by amateurs, and the Titanic was built by professionals. <laughs> no matter how bleak it looks, if God is with you, there's always a rainbow on the other side. And above all else, the most thing, best thing to remember is don't miss the boat. <laughs> Okay, well, let's start our journey, our investigation to uncover what are those four little words that I felt like we needed to double click on as a group of women today. And so what I want you to do is open in your Bible to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 5. So let me just, I know you've read this, but I'm just going to remind you, I'm going to pull you back into the ark. And verse, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 says, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them and all the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, a blameless man among the people of his time. He walked with God, 
Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Okay, one thing we've got to wrap our mind around today is how wicked people had become at this time. We know sin entered the world through Adam and Eve's bad choices, but it had grown to an epic proportion. I want you to imagine yourself living in the worst possible inner city violent gang situation with 9-11 situations happening on a regular basis and that all entertainment was rated X. These people couldn't even think a good thought. The Bible said every inclination, they couldn't even try to think something good. It was violently, deeply corrupt. And, um, you know, just in case God wasn't clear enough when he talked about they can't even think good thoughts, he repeated himself again in verse 11 when he says, the earth was corrupt in God's sight. It was full of violence. I'm going to put an end to all people. So God is a God of emotions. He was saddened by this. He was saddened that children were being raised in these violent situations. He, he knew these people have no hope. We're going nowhere. And so that's what it was like in the world in Noah's day. Any good guy, he hardly had a chance. Trying to be nice, just, you just he barely had an opportunity to do that. Nice folks were either corrupted or killed. Okay? Because you just, you just, there was just no place for it in that type of society. Morality was not to be tolerated in that society. It made too many people uncomfortable. They may say, you know, who appointed you to be judge over me? Who are you to say that this, that, and the other is wrong? It had really, really slid down a slippery slope into a miry pit. And so let's pick back up in verses 13. And it says, So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So he said, make for yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, coat it with pitch inside and out, and this is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening, one cubit high, all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make the lower, middle, and upper decks. So what we need to understand that is a cubit is the length from a man's tip of his finger to his elbow. The ark was 300 of those long. And so this is a massive piece of structure. Many people, um, sadly, it's been depicted by illustrators as much smaller than it really is. You know, uh, I remember reading my little boy's um, Noah's Ark little books and, you know, just basic stories about Noah's Ark. And I can picture this little boat with these animals with their heads out the windows, like we can't quite all fit, we're all just kind of shoved in here, you know? It's kind of a silly picture, but that's how many people think about this thing, but it was a massive structure. It took him a very long time to build. Matter of fact, um, it was one and a half football fields long. So this is huge. It's four stories high and was 85 feet wide. The arc was exactly six times longer then it was wide, and do you know that that's the same type of measurements modern ship builders use today? Okay, so the measurements that, that God led him to do are still pretty much used in, in ships today. So let's jump to chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male, its mate, one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and wife and his sons and wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, 
of birds and all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark as God commanded Noah. And after seven days, the floodwaters came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, and on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were open, and rain fell on earth 40 days and 40 nights. So over and over and over again, God said that he would send a flood, that tragedy would come upon the earth. And did you see the repetitiveness? He keeps saying, I will do this. This will happen. Every creature, everything that has the breath of life in them will be destroyed. You know, I've learned through years and years of being a Bible teacher that when the Bible repeats itself over and over and over, God is trying to make a point. The wickedness of the people at the time would meet with his wrath. And so people had a warning. What was their warning? It was the ark itself. I mean, it was like a hundred-year-long sermon with a visual illustration. People would have come from hundreds of miles around to see this kooky man building a boat in the middle of nowhere. They would have thought, what is he doing? It would have blown their minds. It would have been a tourist attraction. And guess what? He would have said every time somebody said, why are you doing this? He would have said, because it's going to flood and everybody's going to die. You need to repent of your sins. That's, that's what he would have said. He probably said it till he was deaf. He probably wished he could have just had it on record and just, you know, kept playing it. So people had a warning. And what did the scoffers probably say? What flood? I don't see any clouds in the sky. It's not raining. And who are you to tell me to repent? Who are you to judge me? That's what they would have said. Who are you to judge me? It's kind of what people say today, right? You know, who are you to tell me to do anything? You're not my boss. You're not over me. And so that's what would have happened. And on and on and on, while he was building this for years and years, it would have been the same message, a kind of broken record over and over again. So really, Noah's building of the ark was their warning. The Bible says in Genesis 7-7 that Noah entered the door of the ark, and seven days later, the floodwaters came onto the earth. What was he doing for seven days? Well, Peter refers to Noah and says that Noah was a mighty preacher, a righteous preacher. I believe he was on board begging people to repent. Matter of fact, if you think of the animal kinds that needed to be on the ark, there was actually plenty of room for people, more than what was on there, to be on the ark. I've actually visited personally with my own eyes a life-size replica using the biblical um, dimensions that were given. It's, um, it's uh, up towards Kentucky. And I'm not really good with geography, so it's like up towards Kentucky somewhere. But I've been there. <laughs> I was in the car looking at my phone the whole time. I'm like, we're here. Um, but anyway. And, uh, and there's plenty of room on there. I believe, I believe he was begging people to repent of their sin up until the first raindrops happened. Because he was a righteous man. And I'm sure he had friends in the community. And I'm sure he did not want to see them perish. Mankind was heinously evil. God's heart was deeply grieved. The flood happened. It was worldwide, and it devastated the face of the earth. But where do we go from here? There's a lot of different directions I could take right here at this moment. I could talk about how the fact that Noah and his family entering through the door on the side of the ark to escape the floodwaters is actually a foreshadowing as well of Jesus being the door for us. Matter of fact, Jesus said, I am the door and anybody who comes through me to me will be saved. That is actually in John 10, 9. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Saved from what? Saved for eternity with him. Okay, so entering into the door of the ark, and Jesus says, I am the door. They were safe from the flood. We are safe eternally in Christ, anybody who places their faith in him. And so I could go in another total direction about how all, or many, I should say, biblical authors accepted the flood. Did you know that Matthew, Peter, Luke, and the writer of Hebrews all reference Noah and the ark? Okay. So this isn't just Noah's crazy story or something that was made up later. The men that we trust in the Bible 
have also talked about the ark. But more than that, Jesus talked about the ark. Jesus taught about the ark. Let me read it to you. In Matthew 24, Jesus' disciples are asking him questions about the end times. And they say, it says, um, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will the sign of your coming be and the end of the age? Okay, if you jump down, he gives them a very long discourse. But if you jump down to Matt, uh, 30, uh, verse 36, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be with the coming of man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Uh, the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So make no mistake, the flood was real. It was worldwide. It was completely devastating to all life on earth and to the earth itself. And our biblical authors wrote about it, but more importantly, Jesus did himself. So there's many directions we could go into, but I want to rewind us back to those four little words. I've actually already read them. They have to do with Noah himself. What made him different than everybody else at that time? How did he not get swept into the wickedly corrupt culture of the time? How did he not just become just another person like them? Was he more handsome? Was he more politically correct? Was he just more smarter than all them people? He was just, just a smarter person. What made him the standout? What made him have favor in the eyes of the Lord? Our four little words are found in Genesis 6, 8 and 9. Let's go back to it. And it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and you ready for it? He walked with God. Noah had three sons. He walked with God. He wasn't smarter than all those other people. He wasn't more handsome than all those other people. He wasn't stronger than all those other people. He didn't have it all together. He wasn't richer. But he did have one thing that money could not buy, and that is that he walked with God. Now, to say that Noah was righteous and blameless, it doesn't mean that he never sinned. Rather, it meant that he probably kept very short accounts with God. That when he was tempted and when he did sin, he was quick to say, ah, I blew it. Would you forgive me of that, and would you help me stay in step with you? It doesn't mean that he was a perfect man. It just means that he kept short accounts with God, that he loved God, that he walked wholeheartedly with God. He had a close relationship with God, and I believe that daily walk with him helped him withstand the pressure of the ridicule and the laughter at his expense. I have no idea what his wife, wife was saying, what his sons were saying. Dad, you're embarrassing me at school. Don't do this. You know, I don't know what they were saying to him. But he walked with God, and I believe that helped him be the standout of his generation. He didn't just give God his weekends. He didn't just give God an hour on Sunday mornings. He would not have been with, able to withstand this type of ridicule and that type of culture with a one-hour-a-week deal. No, it says he walked with God. What does that mean? I mean, if I'm talking to Kanisha here, and I say, Kanisha, walk with me out to the car while we're talking, that means she's coming with me. You know, if I'm talking on the phone, I'm like, I'm taking you into the bathroom with me. That means you're coming with me, you know? I'm not the only one that does that, right? <laughs> it means they were with you. He took God with him wherever he went. God was with him. God walked with him. It was a, a think about walking with somebody. It means a daily thing, a regular thing, not a sporadic thing. Many people see God as their spare tire. They only access him when there's a blowout. But that was not Noah. Noah didn't just go to God when things were hard. Noah walked with God. Every day of the week, Noah probably spent time praying to God. He wasn't just sporadically praying. 
every day he made that conscious decision to obey God and to fall deeper in love with him and to walk wholeheartedly with him. And he obviously taught his family to live that way as well because they willingly got on to that ark through that door. We can walk with God when we bring God into every aspect of our life. When we don't just leave him at church on Sundays, but when we bring him into Monday and into Tuesday and into Wednesday. For example, when you lay your head down at night, you can bring God with you into your sleep. You can say, Lord, help me walk with you tomorrow. You can say, you are God, you are on your throne, I am at your footstool, your will be done. It's just a pattern that you get into in your mind of giving God your all and your best. Maybe you're a mom and you're changing diapers, you're slicking down hair for school, you're packing lunches. Bring God with you into every one of those little chores. You're saying, Lord, I pray that you would walk with me today. I pray that you'd walk with my son today. I pray that you'd walk with my daughter today. Matter of fact, for two, my two little boys, Josh and Jake, 10 and 8, I pray daily, my hands on them out loud, Lord, I pray that you'd bind their feet to paths of righteousness and shield them from temptation and evil. I, they're probably a little bummed that I'm their mom. <laughs> they literally have to listen to a little sermon every morning. And they're like, can I move now? So I have to do it when they're in bed because then they're not talking back or anything like that, you know? Like, oh, you're half asleep anyway. But um, last night, actually, um, I was tucking uh, Jake into bed, and we were talking about his day and, and gymnastics and all this. And I said, Jake, do you know that the most important thing I do for you every day, you know what that is? It's not washing your clothes. It's not making your lunch or your breakfast or your dinner. It's not giving you your Zyrtec because of your allergies. It's not making sure you've done your homework. The most important thing I do for you every day is to pray for you. Because I want him to walk with God. So I've got to begin that for him myself as, as a mother. Some of your grandmothers, you're doing the exact same thing. When you're waiting at the bus stop, when you're in the car rider line, you bring God with you. He needs to be with you in the car. When you're driving down the road, Lord, I want to walk with you. You're giving him your worries. You're giving him your burdens. You're saying, Lord, help me be brave. Help me be a standout. Help me go against the culture here. Maybe there's a situation going on in your neighborhood or in your family, and you feel torn. You're saying, Lord, come with me. Help me. Walk with me. When we walk with God, we bring God into every aspect of our life. We don't just leave him at church on Sundays. Now, no, one thing we've got to remember is that Noah was an ordinary person. See, if we take the temptation to put Noah in the Superman camp, well, he walked with God because he was Noah. Of course he did. Then we're going to miss something very important, and that is he was an ordinary man like us. See, we'll let ourselves off the hook if we put him into another camp. But if we put himself into the ordinary person camp, then he's just like us. He just made those daily little decisions to not let the crazy busyness of our life crowd out that time with the Lord. When we daily walk with the Lord through Bible reading, through prayer, and through bringing him into everything we're doing that day, I will tell you, most of you know, uh, many of you know, uh, that I teach fitness classes here. And oftentimes I'm in the parking lot, walking into my class, saying, Lord, be a light through me, shine through me. I don't want to be up there performing. I want, to, I want to shine for you. I'm bringing God into the room and onto the stage with me the best that I can. I'm also saying, Lord, help nothing bad happen. Help nobody trip, fall. I don't want to do CPR today. <laughs> I always tell my class, I'm like, please stay hydrated. Do not faint. I have protein, breath. You don't want me giving you CPR today. <laughs> I took a protein shake walking in as well. But... Um, but we need to make sure that we know these words in Scripture are for us. It, we, God used Noah in a major way because he walked with him. God can use us in our family's lives and in our community, not because we're great, but because we walk with God. And that's what we need to take away from this lesson. That's why I'm so glad that this entire story was preserved for, for multiple different reasons. But, but at least for those four little words right there. A woman who walks with God has two main things going on. So if you're taking notes, I'd like for you to take these. A woman who walks with God has a relationship with God. We start a relationship with God by having a conversation with God. 
And it says, Lord, I am a sinner. I repent of my sins. And would you come into my life and be my Lord and Savior? Now, I did that when I was 16 years old. I got down on my knees, actually, and trusted in Christ. I trusted that when he died on the cross as a sinless person, he was doing it for me. It was a substitutionary death he did for me. And so that's when my relationship with God began. Now, I was a creation of God before that. But you're not necessarily born a certain religion. You're not born following Christ. You're born saying no and wanting your stuff for yourself. That's how we're born. But at some point in our life, we've made that faith-filled decision. And we got on Jesus' boat, basically. We recognized in one way or the other, he was the door for eternity. He was the safe ship for all of eternity. And then secondly, we can make, uh, uh, the second thing is that a woman who walks with God is surrendered to his will. She has surrendered control. She has surrendered herself to his direction, to his leading. If he says, forgive this person, she does it. If he says, give to this person, she doesn't have to figure it out. She has to know all the answers. She does it. Listen, Noah could never, it, could have, it would have blown his mind. He couldn't have even comprehended a worldwide flood. We can't comprehend it. And we were reading about it. But he walked in faith. He surrendered his will step by step to what God wanted him to do. So a woman who walks with God has a relationship with God. She's placed her faith in him at some point, And she has surrendered to his will. You know, for me, I find one of the hardest things to surrender to is his timing. I'll do your will. I just want it to happen right now. You know, don't make me wait. Now, we're going to have a, a year together, right? I, I'm going to be in here sharing stories with you, and I promise you I will share multiple stories of how I was stamping my feet and wanting my will and wanting my will that day. And so another thing that we need to remember is that sometimes um, we're just waiting on God's timing. We're waiting on his best. And we're surrendered to his will even if we don't see all the answers and we don't get our timing and we don't get our way. Okay? Let me end by this. One day we're each going to have a headstone. Maybe a gravestone, a memorial perhaps. And the people that survive you are going to speak of your accomplishments. Maybe your degrees, the things that you were talented at, good at. They're going to speak of your great attributes. Loving, enduring, caring. They're going to speak of your roles in life. That you were a mother, a grandmother, a sister, a devoted parent, a devoted spouse. But what we really want on that gravestone what we really want, the overarching thing to be said of us is, tucked in there somewhere, that she walked with God. Let me pray, and then we'll start our discussion groups. Lord, I pray that each woman in here, myself, along with them, would once again surrender all to you, Lord. We want to be women who are standouts in our families, in our circles, in our generation, on this earth. Lord, I pray that as your eyes roam to and fro throughout the earth, that we would find favor in your eyes. That you would be able to look down and say, she walks with me. I'm not just her spare tire. She doesn't leave me at church on Sundays. I'm with her in the car. I'm with her changing the diapers. I'm with her making the lunches. I'm with her running the errands. Father, I pray that if there's anything hindering our lives from that being the case, I pray that you would gently tug at our heart and remind us to surrender and come to you wholeheartedly. And so, Lord, we just say that we love you. We thank you for your word and the examples in it, and especially those four little words today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys, well, you can turn into your groups. Feel free to come up and get um, some more snacks as we get going, and we'll start those discussion questions.
Bye-bye.